Virgil Hill and Peter Garacci will be here to talk basketball with you. Ian Metcalf's got around town sports, and we've got a pair of VIP passes to the Labatt Pro Series Beach Volleyball Tournament this weekend in beautiful Kitsilano. We've got something for everyone. Locker Room is next. Tries to get open. They'll try to cover him for the three points. Brandy Nord gets open. Hill comes down. He's worked over. Hill cuts inside the line. Front four pass. Shot scores! Oh, beautiful goal. Hello everyone and welcome back. Well, a very special hello to all our American viewers this weekend on the long holiday weekend. Well, a Lucky lot guys. has happened. Yes, no kidding. Okay, the Canucks finally signed Dave Babich. The Canucks signed Dave Babich. Uh, what do you think about that? Are our defensive, uh, is our defensive problem solved? No, uh, you'll have to let us know a little bit later when we get to the open phones. They signed Babich, but I'll tell you, Dave Babich must really like playing in Vancouver because San Jose, what a great bunch of defensemen they've got under contract down there. Marty McSorley, they've got uh, Ally Afraidy, uh, Bodger, and also, who else have they got down there? Uh, well, Todd Gill. So wouldn't have he fit in well with that wild bunch? Well, apparently it was a last minute decision. It was quite ironic because Babich could have played down there. But th we were talking earlier on, and maybe they just want to keep him to develop the youngsters, as we said earlier on, because development is something the youngsters need. Maybe they're looking at that for the future. Well, Steve. Steve, uh, you said it right there. We haven't seen hardly any activity with the Canucks on the free agency market. Uh, maybe the viewers at home have heard something. I've been uh, scounging, hounding, and bothering <laughs> all my sources, and they all tell me they've heard nothing. Uh, maybe they're going to be relying on the young defenseman and Babbage to uh, help them along, and uh, maybe some other deals cooking up out there. Let us know what you think a little bit later on in the show. It's going to be quite interesting. We want to see whether something's going to happen with uh, McLean or not, and we've mentioned about that earlier on. But also the 86ers in town Wednesday night. The 86ers finally get back in action at Swan Guard Stadium. They've been away for oh, almost two weeks now. Uh, you just saw a game, I believe, uh, a couple days ago on the network. Shows you what they're like, but they're going to be even better on their return to Swan Guard to take on California this Wednesday because they've got a lot of help from those under-20 players. Well, they've always got a good following, and the one thing I'm really impressed with the 86ers, they put in a good show. It's not high-priced. The, the local public can afford it. They can go out. They can enjoy the games. And let's face it, they've got 28 points right now, 10 behind Seattle. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how they play. Oh, the 86ers look for them to win a lot of their remaining games and uh, definitely get into the playoffs. They've got a strong team this year. You mentioned attendance. Uh, we've been uh, hearing from the ownership down there. A little bit disappointed in the attendance, but, you know, every home game, but they're doing a lot for the development of soccer in the province. We definitely want to keep them going. So take the kids, take the family going out there and check out a game. And they're going to get some of the youngsters back as well that we were talking about. So the youngsters back, that's going to add a little bit of depth to them as well. Oh, yeah, look for Stevie Kindle to make an impact right away. Uh, just coming off that big high at the under-20 tournament, Canada going, as you've heard by now, further than ever before in that tournament. Those youngsters, uh, some of them already being talked to by European teams, so you might not get a chance to see them very long, okay? We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the open phones. Great game as far as I'm concerned down at BC Place this week, Steve. Lions played very strong. It was nice to see them. But it's ironic that the people that they actually leave partway through the fourth quarter. Well, you know, uh, sometimes people leave if the game's out of hand. Uh, I didn't see too many people leaving during the quarter, but I did notice, and if you're <laughs> one of them, shame on you, a few people walking out as the, the, the uh, Stampeders were getting ready to set up for that field goal. Let me tell you, people, field goals are not a guarantee in this league. Uh, they can be blocked, and the team needs you more than ever when they're trying to block a kick in the last play of the game. Just a fantastic finish by the Lions, and if you were walking out and you missed it, well, you got what you deserve as far as I'm concerned. CFL seems to be a little stronger this year than what it's been in the past. Well, they say, uh, and if you look at the, the teams in uh, up close, and we can talk about this on open phones too, uh, with the exception of maybe one team, uh, maybe two, and they're both in the East, uh, 
the teams are very competitive. You're going to see a lot of games coming down to the wire, provided everybody stays healthy. Well, that's the one thing, health, and they have to have that to keep the league going. They're trying to promote it. They're trying to get the fans out. They want more people to go out, and we, we encourage them to go out because the one thing we've spoken about is 18,000 people at BC Place virtually makes the place look empty. Maybe they should talk about blanketing off the top section to make the bottom look a little fuller. Be a little nicer. Okay, well, uh, we can talk about all that stuff coming up in open phones a little later in the show. Don't forget, we've got a pair of VIP passes to give away for a beautiful beach volleyball tournament coming up this weekend, so stick around. You might win those right now, though. Ian Medcalf's got Around Town Sports. Well, thanks, okay. guys, and hello to you at home. Well, as summer appeared for a brief period last week, action heated up in the Western Lacrosse Association, and it looks like the North Shore Indians are taking the league's decision to strip them of five wins out on the rest of the league. The Indians crushed the Maple Ridge Berards 18-4 at Cam Neely Arena on Tuesday night as Paul Gate led the way with five goals. Friday night in Burnaby, the score was a little closer, but the result the same as the Indians overcame a 5-2 first period deficit to defeat the Lakers 13-8. Jamie Bowen making his first appearance this year scored three goals in the second period. An abbreviated week ended last night with the Coquitlam Adnax and the new Westminster Salmon Bellies playing to a 10-10 overtime tie. A footnote to that game, veteran Jordy Dean of the Salmon Bellies collected his 1400th career point on a second period assist. Congratulations Jordy. Now a look at the standings after week nine sees a continuing log jam with only three points separating first and fifth going to be a real battle down the stretch for that fourth and final playoff spot. Looking at the scoring leaders this week, Russ Hurd of the Lakers continues to lead the parade of snipers with 23 goals and 39 assists, but closing in are Coquitlam's Jason Walder and North Shore's Kirk Molaski, both with 58 points. Now the player of the week is North Shore superstar Paul Gate. Gate collected five goals and added two assists against the Berards Tuesday night. He was also named the game's first star. And of course, our heavyweight of the week, this week, it's Trevor Duke of the Maple Ridge Barrage. The Duke takes the title this week with 81 penalty minutes. Now, as the regular season winds down, here's what's happening this week in the WLA. That Tuesday night game is going to be a big one as it's a rematch between the Indians and the Barrage. The Barrage looking for a little bit of revenge in that one. Wednesday sees Coquitlam in North Shore with two games on Friday. But the game you don't want to miss this week is Saturday night in Coquitlam when the Victoria Shamrocks visit the Coquitlam Sports Center to take on the Adenacs. That game also just happens to be our next Rogers lacrosse game of the week. So if you want to see yourself on TV, come on out and be part of the crowd. Now in soccer news, the rosters for the A-League All-Star Game in Rochester, New York were announced on Thursday with 86ers Dominic Mobilio and Garrett Cush taking the forward spots for the Western Conference. The game will be played July 15th. But before that game, Mobilio and Cush have some business to take care of out at Swan Guard Stadium this Wednesday as the 86ers host the California Jaguars. Game time is 7.30. Now that game will be televised and shown next Saturday night on Rogers. Now the Pacific Division standings show the 86ers have dropped into a tie for second place with Colorado, 10 points behind arch rival Seattle. However, look for the 86ers to make a run in the last quarter of the season as the four players that suited up for the National Under-20 team return for the game Wednesday night. Now let's turn our attention to the other boys of summer, the Vancouver Canadians. The Seas had some trouble with the Edmonton Trappers last week, losing three of four. Wednesday's a close game. Thursday, the, uh, the Seas coming back, defeating the Trappers 8-3. Now Friday night, the Canadians started a four-game series with Tacoma, losing 5-0. And last night, in a game televised live on Rogers, the Seas gained some revenge, winning 4-1. The two teams finish off the series with games today and tomorrow out at the Nat. Now last night's victory kept the Canadians three games behind the Trappers in the PCL's Northern Division. Now after the All-Star break Tuesday and Wednesday, the Seas open up a four-game series in Salt Lake on Thursday. And finally, in off-the-field news, the Anaheim Angels have finally recalled Todd Green. The slugging catcher broke the Seas record for home runs two weeks ago when he hammered his 25th dinger of the year. The 26-year-old was hitting 357 with 75 ribbies to go along with the 25 home runs. 
Now Todd wasted no time in pressing his new employers, hitting a single in his first at bat against the big unit of Seattle, Randy Johnson, Friday night. And as we leave you, congratulations to Vancouver's own Jessica DeGlau. Jessica captured the bronze medal in the 200 meter butterfly stroke at the Janet Evans International down in LA. She came within two one hundredths of a second of beating her Canadian record. Jessica also captured a golden bronze medal last week at a meet in Santa Clara. That's Around Town Sports for this week. Coming up in locker room, Kevin Cady with hoopsters of Virgil Hill and Peter Garacci. Well, welcome back. Locker Room continues. You're up to date there with Around Town Sports. Lots to cover, even more coming up this week. But there was a tournament recently, five on five, held here at uh, Capilano College over in uh, North Van, and it was called Who's Got Game? And uh, the two guests joining me right now, anybody asking uh, them that question, then the answer is most definitely yes. Uh, Virgil Hill, uh, assistant coach up at SFU, but a fine player in his own right, and Peter Gracci. An SFU alumni, but also uh, playing now in the Italian League. You got to tell us about uh, the tournament. I know your sponsor was Triple Threat. So how did that all come about? You guys finished second. Yeah. Well, uh, Steve Anderson, uh, one of our teammates, he uh, he worked for Triple Threat Oregon Basketball Academy, and uh, and so they sp they paid for our entry fee and things like that. And then uh, we got a bunch of the guys together, the old SFU old boys, basically, and uh, we just played together and went into battle and came, you know, happened to come in second. That's all of those alumni games paying off for you guys staying in shape. Anyways, we want to invite your calls. Uh, we can talk basketball. I have to tell you, these guys have some connections in basketball when it comes to the province. Uh, they've been involved in the game for a long time out here and uh, good friends with Jay Triano. So you can give us a call, find out about the SFU season that's coming up ahead or ask some questions about the Italian League. We've been hearing more and more about European leagues as Canadians go over there and play. And uh, somebody who can tell us a lot about that, of course, is uh, Peter. So this will be your second season playing in the Italian League? Yeah, I leave for Italy July 25th, my second season over in Italy. And I'm playing for Scavellini Pesaro, which is a A1 Division I t team. And uh, yeah, it should, should be a good year. We got a lot of new faces this year. And uh, it's a competitive league, very competitive league. And uh, it's very professionally run. You talk about a competitive league. Just give us a little feel. How is the season compared to an NBA season in, in the length of games? I think it's probably about two-thirds of the games. And uh, the talent, I don't think the Italian players aren't. It's not. I mean, a lot of people say the Italian league is right underneath the NBA. But really, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a ways under. But the, the imports we have, like the American players, we're allowed two per team. Those are usually NBA experienced guys. So. Excellent. Like players, yeah. And what about the crowds, Peter? How are they out at these games? Is it is it fun to play out there? Yeah, it, it can be fun and it can be a little bit nerve wracking. The crowds tend to put a lot of pressure on you. They're a little bit wild. I mean, we, our gym we hold about ten thousand people, and our fans are standing the whole time, just going nuts. And it's kind of kind of nerve wracking when it gets down to like a minute left in a two point game. It's kind of but it's good to have them on our side. That's for sure. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the five-on-five -five tournament because from uh, that was a well-advertised event that was happening uh, just a little while ago, and I know that uh, probably attracted a lot of teams. Uh, how many people were involved with it, and, and just uh, explain to us a little bit of how what you felt like playing at that tournament. Was it really competitive? Uh, I I was I participated in a few money tournaments last out of my senior season. I got the opportunity to play in some money tournaments in Montana, and there's a lot of good talent. But I was really surprised with the amount of good talent that showed up in uh, at Capilano College. There's some really good players, some players that have some overseas experience, some guys that have, you know, even got some looks from the NBA. So it was a, it was a pretty competitive tournament. I was pretty happy with it. Well, we've got a, we've got a caller. We'll get back to that a little, little bit later, Virgil. We've got a caller. Sean uh, from Burnaby, you're in the locker room. Uh, I was just wondering if you guys ever, you know, hurt yourself doing dunk shots and stuff. You guys, some of you guys can really fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've actually had an injury in the past. Actually, it was very recent, I, I went up to uh, just at the SFU Summer League. <laughs> I went up to dunk, and uh, some guy, I think he got a little bit intimidated, tried to move out of the way, but he instead he kind of hit my legs from underneath me, and I ended up going straight into the floor. So oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah, there are some there are some in injuries, especially when you're getting up in the air and you're unbalanced and you don't really know where your feet are going to land. It, it can get a little bit dangerous, but that's that's the way the game is played. 
Well, Virgil's a little smoother. How about yourself? Any well, problems? Well, probably back in the uh, back in the high school days, but now being an old guy, I tend not to uh, you know do those things anymore. I leave it up to guys like Pete. <laughs> okay. Disperse the ball around. We're going to go to another caller. Raquel, are you there? I'm here. Just wanted to say hi to Virgil and Pete. And I was wondering if you guys could tell me a little bit more about triple threat basketball. Okay. Well, uh, triple threat. It's uh, actually an academy that uh, uh, that operates all year round and. Uh, and what it does, it, it gives youngsters an opportunity to uh, uh, to just hone their basketball skills. Uh, they have, there's you know fine coaching, Steve Anderson, Brian Lee, to name a few coaches, Novell Thomas even from SFU, uh, and they actually uh, put the kids through uh, many drills. So and, it's uh, not like a camper. Well, it, it, it runs all year actually. What it does, it, it runs uh, from September, uh, you know, through April basically, and, and even throughout the summer. But uh, it just gives youngsters an opportunity that aren't involved with their school. To uh, you know, to actually play. All right, thanks, guys. Have fun. Hey, thanks for your call, Raquel. Uh, just to to stick with that for a little bit. What ages are we talking about, kids? Uh, anywhere from I believe ages nine through uh, nine through I would guess seventeen years old. So a good chance to get some early, some good training early for those kids because we know, uh, you know, in a lot of the schools uh, these days, they can't really have a really mm -hmm. organized uh, training session when it comes to physical education. So if you're interested in basketball or, or one of your uh, relatives or children are, this is an excellent opportunity to get them some good training. Uh, getting basketball maybe elevated to where hockey is, where kids mm -hmm. are getting involved very early, getting some great instruction. Uh, you mentioned Novell Thomas right. and uh, Steve Anderson. You can't get much better than that. Yeah, those are. I mean, those are two quality, you know, quality players, and you know, they make excellent coaches. And, uh, and you know, the kids are just, you know, they're really lucky to have two individuals such as those two uh, that really can, you know, show them the ropes. Mm -hmm. And and let's stick with that. We mentioned Novell Thomas, and a lot of our regular viewers of the network will know that SFU uh, Sports is a big part of our sports productions and you'll be familiar with both these guys Peter as a player and Virgil as a coach up at SFU. Uh, let's talk about the team this year, the real uh, the men's team really. I guess uh, the major loss would be Novell Thomas. Yeah, correct. Uh it, it, he really had a great senior season and uh you know he he was our leader on and off the floor uh you know both uh, statistically you know even emotionally everything and uh losing Novell is actually going to hurt us quite a bit but we uh we do have a young gentleman coming in uh from Quebec and he's hopefully going to help lessen you know the you know the uh, loss of Novell along with uh Maple Ridge kid Sean Halverson and uh two other Ontario kids that are going to be coming in this Yeah yeah this as, as freshmen yeah Good. so uh, hopefully uh you know, we're able to, you know, and then Sean Ramjag saying he's actually gotten a lot better uh, throughout the summer playing against Pete. And, 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 <laughs> oh, well, and, and I guess so. Steinfeld. He survived? Yeah, well, he's surviving. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, I, I think our team, we're going to have a great shot at uh, repeating what we did last year, if not even going one step beyond and getting to the national tournament. Well, just to fill in people if they're not familiar with how well SFU did, uh, in his second year as head coach, uh, Scott Clark took his team to the conference final the first time ever in the school's oh, uh, 30, over 35 yeah. year history. Yeah. So uh, the bar has been set a little bit high by the people down at SFU this season. But uh, once again, you'll be getting to see some great coverage of, of SFU action basketball, men's and women's, uh, coming up on the network uh, starting in around November, December time. So when does uh, that all get together for you? When do you start uh, getting involved up, up on the mountain? Well, we start, uh, training camp starts the second week in, Sept or the second week in September, and then uh, we pick the team based the third week and then from there it's just we just grind it out for about a month there and then we go on our NCAA tour uh, which starts uh, no, uh, November 7th and then we play uh, some exhibition games early uh, or I should say late uh, October so late October early November is when our season really starts well, uh, have you been uh, following the Grizzlies, I guess, like uh, all basketball people around Vancouver? And uh, every, the big story, uh, we get it from our callers all the time, uh, the Grizzlies got some more money now, they've got another draft choice, somebody that they figure could be their number one. Um, everybody's wondering about uh, free agents, the big name player that they're going to bring on board. Do you, have you heard anything, first of all, and do you think they will bring somebody on? I'll let both of you answer. Okay. Oh, I think they... I think they're looking for somebody in the power four position. Otis Thorpe has been talked about, and hopefully if they get him, he can be a player that can definitely definitely help the Grizzlies next year, just with some experience in the front court to help big country around the basket. And I, th I think with their draft pick, Antonio Daniels, they'll be looking pretty good. As long as they just come clean in the free agency, they should, they should be looking pretty good. I guess uh, power forward, that's what we'd call you, wouldn't we? Yeah. 
<laughs> that would be a great addition to the team, but uh, you're you're on your way, working your way into the NBA, I guess, with some uh, good luck. You never know, you might get it up there. Yeah. The Italian League is quite an accomplishment anyways, yeah. coming from SFU. Yeah. So you've done well. It's uh, too bad we couldn't get some tape with us. Uh, we could show you a little bit of Peter's game if you talk about who's got game. So Virgil, tell us, what have you heard around Giz the Grizzlies camp this year? How are things going? Uh, basically the same, you know, the same thing as Pete. Uh, I think generally everyone has that same, you know, like what they read from the newspapers. Uh, Antonio Daniels is, is a great pick, and uh, uh, Otis Thorpe was the guy that was mentioned. But uh, if they could, I think Brian Grant would be a great, you know, would be a great pickup from, uh, he's a free agent with Sacramento. Oh, so okay. he would be a great guy to pick up. But if they have enough money, who knows? Really quiet uh, on both uh, in both organizations right now, the Grizzlies and the Canucks. They've got the ability to sign some people, and I know we're going to have a ton of callers when we go to open phones, which we will in a little while, uh, wondering what's going to go on with the Grizzlies, and we'll hear all kinds of all kinds of stories. So, uh, what about uh, playing wise for you? We know Peter's going off to uh, Italy. Are you going to be doing any more tournaments uh, over the summer? Uh, well, being an old guy, um, I <laughs> you know that last tournament actually. Well, we played six games, so. Uh, sort of took its toll on me and I just I, I just like to I'm gonna just take a rest now and just sort of work out and uh, just you know do some hiking things like that mm -hmm. some low impact activities but uh, next summer uh, being that I'm a citizen of the country of Antigua and same with Novell Thomas uh, next summer we're actually looking to uh, uh, represent the country uh, on their on their national team, which is you know quite a small team, but uh, we're going to hopefully represent them in uh, the game uh, these uh, games called the Caricom Games. It's a Caribbean Caribbean Commonwealth. So, well, uh, so a couple of ringers coming over from Canada. Uh, I wouldn't say ringers, <laughs> but it's just uh, it's going to be fun. Well, that would be excellent. Uh, we want to wish both of you good luck, Peter, over in Italy Thank for you. sure. Uh, you know, you carry the flag wherever you go, and everybody's oh, yeah. impressed by your aggressive style of play, I'm sure. And uh, wish you a lot of success up on the mountain uh, this year, Virgil. We'll all be watching, as always, SFU as they make a drive for the uh, championships in the NAIA. we got to go, though, uh, but uh, stick around, because Darren Campbell is going to give you a little preview of what the Labatt uh, Beach Volleyball Tournament's all about. And we've got tickets to give away about a little bit later. And then Steve's got Dave Evans, so a little bit of something for everyone. Stick around. Last week at Ashbridge's Bay in Toronto, beach volleyball took to the sand in the Labatt's Pro Series. Spectators were treated to two days of warm sunny weather and exciting volleyball action like this. This week you can see all the action live as the tour moves to Kitts Beach in Vancouver. Plenty of local talent will participate and Canadian women Athena and Christina will try for another finals appearance. And Olympic bronze medalists Heese and Childs will be sure to put on a good show. Another sure bet to be a crowd favorite is American Sinjin Smith. Be sure to tune into Locker Room in two weeks as we bring you a report on how it all shakes out at Kitts Beach. Welcome back. Well, as we promised earlier on, WLA color commentator as well as lacrosse Hall of Famer Dave Evans has joined us now. First off, Dave, congratulations on going into the Hall of Fame and welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Okay, first off, we want to find out, now that you're back in the coaching realm, what's your official title? Uh, I'm not really sure, to be very honest with you. Um, I, I am, I, am a, I guess, for lack of a better term, I am an interim 
co-coach of the Burnaby Lakers senior team. They had a coaching change, I guess, about a month ago now. I was asked to come on and take over the team as a head coach. I just wasn't prepared to do that. I have, I have commitments, as you mentioned, one of which is with Rogers as a color commentator, which I enjoy very much. And uh, the other commitment, of course, is to my family. And uh, after giving it some thought, I said, look, I'll, I'll come out and run the practices, but that's the best I can do. And as a matter of fact, I've only, the only games I've seen the team play have been the three that we've actually broadcast as games of the week. So that's my position. I, I run the practices. Paul Robotham, I guess, would be the other interim co-coach. He runs the bench during the games. And uh, it's not the greatest situation in the world, but, but it's, it's better than nothing. So when they're doing something wrong during the game, do they actually look up and wonder what they're doing? <laughs> well, when they're doing something wrong during the game, uh, Paul gets the flack for it, which is great. And I can, and I can <laughs> criticize on TV, which, which is a great situation. Okay, now you're involved in a very special event this coming week. I don't know how special it's going to be. We have our, uh, our 1977 Vancouver Burrard Man Cup team, which I was a part of, uh, are going to play the current Maple Ridge Burrard team. Just a fun game, no pads, sticks, gloves. Uh, I don't even know if we're wearing helmets, to be honest with you. Uh, no contact. Um, with all the money that's raised, it's going to be going to uh, the Maple Ridge Minor Lacrosse System. And this thing came about uh, f for three reasons. Number one, uh, as just to get our guys together again. It's 20 years since we last won the Man Cup, and we, we want to get the guys together and, and do something. Um, secondly, to raise some money for the kids. I mean, anything we can do to help out raise money for Minor Lacrosse, we certainly want to do. And thirdly, I think, uh, and I hope the current Burrard players are realize this, it's a chance for them to realize that they, they do have a heritage. I mean, they have a, the, the Vancouver Burrard and uh, uh, name has got a tremendous history behind it. Uh, we're the last team to win a Man Cup, of course, the 77 team. To, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of great teams prior to that team, and, and it, I think it would be important for us to let them know that they do, have a, they do have a history, even though they've only been in Maple Ridge for a couple of years. Well, that's true. Well, we want to invite callers right now. Give us a call. You can talk lacrosse. You can talk to Dave Evans and uh, see if you can stump them on one or two questions. We, we'd love to do that. But uh, <laughs> we talked about the growth of minor lacrosse in the lower mainland. Uh, the one question I keep getting asked is about expansion. Why are there no WLA teams out in the valley? And I'm talking like Abbotsford or possibly Chilliwack. Well, I think uh, at this point in time, there aren't enough kids of the senior A, junior A level. There are a lot of kids now from the, from the Valley, from Chilliwack, from Abbotsford, playing on junior A teams, uh, but not enough to really stock a senior A team. And even though you do have a draft situation where players are drafted by the senior A teams, you still have a situation where basically every senior team has got a junior A team in the, in the, near, in the near vicinity, Burnaby and Burnaby, Poco and Coquitlam around the Adnac area and so forth. But I would think four or five years from now, as, as the game, as you say, grows out in the, out in the Valley, um, you're going to see perhaps a junior A team in Abbotsford or in Chilliwack and from there it's a natural progression to, to perhaps a WLA team. Well, a lot of the players are getting involved. They're coaching in the minor lacrosse, uh, so that might be a nice, uh, nice feature for them to do. Oh, yeah. Well, I think a lot of, well, a lot of, a lot of the, the relatively young players, like players in their, in their mid to late 30s who have just retired, are moving out that way just for reasons of economics, <laughs> if for nothing else. And, uh, and, of course, as they have children or as they get involved in lacrosse, that's the area they're going to get involved in. Of course, it's the area that's their home, not necessarily the area where they played their, their senior lacrosse. Well, it's always nice that the people that have put something into the game want to give something back and we've seen that over the course of the years Paul Parnell Jack beyond just just to name two so that's something that we need and we need a little more of from those players so we're gonna get more thoughts from you on the WLA right after this time out Watch Fishing with Shelly and Courtney on Rogers Community Television. Shelly and myself hope to reel you in with our celebrity guests who will talk about their fishing experiences. Guest chefs show you how to prepare what you catch. So drop the anchor and pull up a seat. Did you miss our program on schizophrenia, dating, relationships, sex, the Surrey School Board? Well, you can catch the best of Mestiza this summer, Tuesdays at 4.30 on Rogers Community Television. There's so much to see at Science World. Amaze yourself. 
Cyberspace is TV for your fingers, and you're doing the transmitting. Cyberspace is lipstick and chainsaws and anything you want to say. It's a 12-year-old with an opinion on war, the power to say up periscope, and a sea of knowledge. It's a connection machine with no fixed address, and I want to be hardwired. Introducing The Wave from Rogers. High-speed internet access by cable modem. Download in seconds, not minutes. In my world, I greet the future with a wave. You're not going to miss all of this, are you? Hello, I'm Chris Tidd. The key to your financial future is managing your money well. Join me each week for the investment scene on Rogers Community TV. From watching Yard Yak, I've learned all kinds of handy tips, like what kind of plants to attract birds, see? Meow. Yard Yak is on Rogers Tuesdays at 11.30, when the rat rat robin goes bob bob bobbing along. Meow. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Well, I believe we have a caller on the line all set to talk and see if they can stump Dave Evans, so we're going to find out right now. Uh, hello, caller? Hi, how you doing? Uh, very good. What can we do for you? Well, I just wondering, I'd like to ask a kind of a three-part question for Dave there. How you doing, Dave? Good. Good. I'm just wondering, uh, who do you think is going to make the playoffs this year in the senior, uh, in the senior league for the WLA? Uh, and who's not going to make the playoffs? And uh, just wondering if you think there's going to be a matchup, Gate versus Gate, for the final. And uh, just wondering if you're going to be fit or fat for the game this week. <laughs> well, <laughs> we'll, answer, we'll answer question number three first. I will definitely be fat for the game. I, we just came back from a half an hour, 45 minute practice, and I, I definitely know I'm going to be fat for Friday. No doubt about that. Uh, the other questions. Um, well, 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 we'll take it the easy way, the easy route, and say who I think is not going to make it. And I obviously Burnaby's an easy one, but uh, I think New Westminster is going to be the other team that's going to be the odd man out. I think New West, I think uh, North Shore is definitely going to make the playoffs, and uh, I think North Shore could finish as high as first. Is going to be a bit of a reach, but uh, which brings us to the gate versus gate thing. I, I, I sincerely hope, as does everybody else, that there is a gate versus gate matchup in the playoffs. But uh, uh, for that to happen, I, I think it's going to have to. Well. The thing, the, the playoffs, are, the uh, standings are so close right now. There are so many, uh, so many different combinations. Um, I couldn't even give you an honest answer on that. I hope there is. Uh, whether there is or not, it, there's just so many combinations. It wouldn't be fair to even hazard a guess. But I think New Westminster and Burnaby are going to be the teams out, and I know I'm going to be fat on Friday. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to thank you for your call. Okay, uh, interesting. We were talking about matchup. Uh, you naturally said Burnaby's not going to be there. That's tough because uh, with you being involved with the team now, uh, a little bit of insight there. But, uh, okay, going on now, we talked earlier on about the Man Cup Championship. The Man Cup's going to be played one of two sites. It's either going to be in the lower mainland, and despite the fact that if North Shore wins, will they play in North Shore or will they play in Queen, Queen's Park, or will they play on the island? Uh, well, obviously, if Victoria wins, all the games will be at Memorial Arena on the island. Uh, but if any of the teams, from the, my understanding at least is, if any team from the mainland wins, the, uh, the Man Cup will be played at Queen's Park. My understanding is they've already booked dates for Queen's Park starting in the first week of September, and uh, that's where it'll be no matter who wins from the, from the uh, West. Now, in the past, Coquitlam has hosted the Man Cup in Coquitlam. Uh, North Shore, I know there was a big to-do last year when, the, when North Shore's champ or final round games were moved from North Shore to Queen's Park. Um, what they may end up doing is playing maybe one or two games in the venue of the of the of the actual winning team, and then moving it to Queens Park. But Queens Park's the logical place. It's the best arena. It's the biggest arena of the local ones. And uh, from a just strictly from an economic standpoint, that's pretty much where you have to have it. Okay, growth of the league right now. We talked about possible expansion. Uh, looking out in the valley, uh, what about south of the border? Well, it's funny. Uh, there, there's been some talk. Uh, I guess not real serious talk recently about putting a team in Bellingham. Uh, and I think I, I think it's a fascinating idea. Uh, I mean, Bellingham, quite frankly, is probably closer for a lot of the local players than going out to Chilliwack or Abbotsford would be. Uh, you know, it's only a half an hour hop. They're building a new arena down there. Uh, there was some interest, I guess, eight or ten years ago uh, at putting some exhibition games and maybe putting a senior B team down in, in, in the old Bellingham arena just to kind of give it a trial run. And, um, the thing to me is, if you're going to do something like that, do it intelligently. Don't jump down there and just throw a senior A team in. Play some exhibition games. Maybe have each team play one of their home games in Bellingham so that they're actual real league games and not just exhibition. See how it flies and go from there. Okay, good. we got another caller for you. Sean. Hi, Dave. I'm curious. Uh, where exactly do you see in the WLA, where do you see the teams ending up at the end of this year with the North Shore team losing the five wins? They're on a bit of a comeback, I see now. And uh, I'm just curious as to who you see finishing first and what do you think the playoff matchups might be? 
Well, as I said to the last caller, it's, it's difficult to, to predict because things are so close. I mean, you look at the standings now, you've got two teams with 17 points, one with 16, one with 15, one with 14. Uh, you can't get any closer than that. Um, as I said, I definitely think North Shore is going to make the playoffs. Uh, I think undisputedly they're the best team in the league right now. They have the best mix of talent and grit and goaltending and coaching. Uh, to me, that's the four ingredients you, you obviously want to have a contending team. Uh, whether they can, they can make up all of the ten points and finish first, um, I don't know. It obviously comes down to other teams, who beats who, and so on and so forth. Uh, the only thing that would be unfortunate, I think, from a North Shore standpoint, is for them to finish third or fourth where they don't have the home floor advantage. And if you end up in a, in a situation where you're playing Victoria and they have the home floor advantage, there is definitely an advantage there because you've got the flights back and forth and so forth. So I, I say I, I wouldn't even want to guess at what the matchups are going to be. I, I, if I had to pick and make a prediction right now, I, I would think North Shore is going to finish second, Maple Ridge or Victoria first. I think Coquitlam may fade a little bit and finish fourth, and uh, New Westminster and Burnaby on the outside looking in. Okay, thanks, Sean. Okay, now uh, once again, going to the lineup, uh, the 10 points everybody keeps talking about. And the reason the 10 points, if everyone is not familiar with it, is North Shore, they were caught playing an ineligible player. Uh, the league has taken away 10 points or five games. How has that affected them? Never mind the morale. How do you think that will affect the team in the stretch? Well, I think... Uh I think it's the best thing that could ever happen, for, happen to them. Now, that, that's not to say I think it's a fair decision. I, I, well, we could sit and argue that. Uh, sure, you know, so that's a precedent, though. Home. It does, and I, I think, quite frankly, just so we don't belabor the point, uh, obviously they made a mistake. There was a bookkeeping error or a clerical error. I don't really think the punishment fits the crime. It, it's almost like giving somebody life in prison for jaywalking kind of a thing. But the rule is there, and you know the league chose to uphold the rule uh, to, its, to its sternest. I think in the long run, though, uh, because I cer certainly believe, as I said, that North Shore is going to make the playoffs. I think it's going to help them. It's obviously brought the team together. Uh, from a coaching standpoint, uh, coaches Bill Monroe and Rick Horner can, can, can keep driving into the players, hey, everybody's against us, nobody wants us to win. Whether that's true or not, of course, is irrelevant. But that's what's going to be told to the players. The players are thinking that way. Um, that coupled with the fact that I, 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 do, I think they've got the best team anyway, uh, I think uh, once they enter the playoffs, in effect, they're gonna f they're, they will have played like 10 consecutive playoff games because every game they play has playoff ramifications. That's right. And once they reach the playoffs, we both know it's a different series altogether. Dave from North Van, how you doing? Uh, good. Uh, just uh, two quick questions. Uh, one uh, first uh, one is, uh, what's it going to take to bring people back to these games like they did in Carestill Arena back when you played, Dave? They packed that place for games every, you know, every Tuesday night when you guys played. Uh, what is it going to take for this league to bring people back? And uh, well, another quick question, where is Ronnie Pinder these days? Uh, well, answer the second question first. Ronnie Pinder uh, is living out in Richmond. He has a little baby boy. I guess uh, Wyatt's a couple of years old now. And Ronnie's actually playing with our old-timers team. Uh, our very old timers team uh, this Friday night out in Maple Ridge. Ronnie will be in the lineup for our 77 man cup team against the uh, Maple Ridge Brards. The first question, I don't know. The, the, to me, the big problem is well, the problem is twofold. Number one, people's attitudes or the public's attitudes now are so much different than they were 20 years ago. 20 years ago and further back than that, uh, people went to spectator sports in the summer because there really wasn't anything else to do. Uh, whereas now there's so much more emphasis on, uh, well, participation, to take the, the, government's, the government's word, whereas people are into cycling and boating and swimming and camping, and people seem to have more leisure time. And quite frankly, it's probably a good thing. And, and unfortunately, there isn't the time remaining to, to come out and watch spectator sports like lacrosse. The other thing, too, is I think, I, I really think um, the, media, the media coverage is not what it used to be. And uh, that certainly, certainly uh, would help to have the media coverage we had back in the, uh, in the 70s. Okay, we're going to take one more quick caller for you. Mike. I have a comment and two questions for Dave. First okay. of all, I have to make it quick. Uh, first of all, um, my dad played with you in his days in the Brards, Bob Salt. I have two questions for you. Were you a reaction goalie or an angle goalie, and which style is more popular in the WOA these days? Uh, I was definitely a reaction goaltender. I, mean, I would like to think I played my angles pretty well, too, but I, w I was definitely a reaction goaltender. And today in the WLA, no question, the more, more popular is the angle style. I mean, really, Dwight Metke and Dallas Elliott, who I think are clearly the top two goaltenders in the league, are really the only two reaction goaltenders left in the league, perhaps Bobby Hayes and Victoria. Okay, that basically answers the question because we know goaltenders are very instrumental in the game right now today. We want to thank all the callers, uh, and we hope uh, that Dave's answered your questions somewhat. And uh, go on out and watch him play on Friday night. It's going to be interesting to see whether he's fit or fat right now. <laughs> but uh, once again, when we come back, we're going to have open phones. We're going to look at a special message right now from the Special Olympics.
the Special Olympics is a year-round program of sport and recreation designed for children and adults who are mentally handicapped. Thanks to the dedication and commitment of volunteer support staff, it has enjoyed a steady growth over the last two decades. It is now a nationwide network serving 10,000 athletes. The Special Olympians train all year long to improve physical strength, acquire new skills, and enjoy competition against their peers. From community-based programs, they can participate in regional and provincial competitions. With hard work and perseverance, they can ultimately go on to compete in national and even international events. It all begins with people just like you. People who support the Special Olympics and help it grow. That's the reason for the law enforcement torch run. It's all about people joining together to spread the word and help raise money for a very important organization. The more awareness that can be created for the Special Olympics, the better the quality of life becomes for mentally handicapped people everywhere. It's more than just participating in sports. It's a way for these athletes to gain confidence in themselves, to learn how to embrace life with a new sense of pride and dignity. They find their motivation and self-esteem through sports training. And uh, welcome back. Locker Room continues, and we should mention that that torch run will start tomorrow out in West Vancouver and make its way to Coquitlam Town Centre for Thursday. Uh, just great if you can catch a look at that along the way. I'm sure it'll be well worth your while. Well, it is. We want to get a lot of people involved in that and get them out to watch it, participate, get involved, because it's without the volunteers. Something like this is not a successful event. And, and go out because a lot of people are giving... I want to open up the lines for you and hear your comments. I'll tell you there's been uh, very little talk in the free agency market for both the Grizzlies and the Canucks. Let us know if you've heard anything. Let us know what you think about some of them. got to get out of the house at least once or twice this week. Yeah, this is the type of weekend that a lot of the wives don't like because the guys just want to get involved and sit at home and watch it and watch the tube all the time and uh, sometimes they get put in the back burner but uh, take the wife out and have fun and all that stuff because it's something that we need but yes sports we want to get involved uh, talked about uh, different events I'm really pleased that the 86ers are going to be playing back at home on, on Wednesday at Swan Guard I like Swan Guard I don't know what it is but it's just something that magnifies you when you go there Swan Guard is a great uh, stadium it's well suited for soccer the uh, surface there is excellent all the players visiting players uh, alike they love to play on that turf down there. Uh, the only problem is uh, we need a few more bodies out there if uh, they're going to be able to keep it going down there. And easily we can get five, 6,000 people out. Uh, and you can make some noise at Swan Guard too, which is another great thing uh, about the way the stadium's set up, uh, open air. But I wanted to mention, Steve, uh, before we get to the callers, that um, when you were talking to Dave Evans, there's a rumor, or we not a rumor, we have <laughs> inside information from our sources deep, deep within the WLA that Paul Gate has agreed to play the remainder of the games for the Indians. Uh, he's already played the six that uh, he was contracted to play, but apparently he's going to play the rest of the five. He has been so impressed by his teammates' play since uh, being penalized, those five wins, that he's going to come and play with them. Well, it's nice to have him come back and play, but the question is, is do they really need him? They're playing very, very well. Got a caller, Bob. Yes, yeah, Steve, how are you? Very well. Oh, you know, I'm going to talk about just like the same thing you're saying about the 86ers. It, you know, no, lack of crowds. Uh, let me just turn it down a bit. Lack of crowds here is because of, I think they should get a beer license. I really do. You know, it'll make a difference. Uh, that there's not going to be any trouble if they do it. They get a beer license. Everybody in, in Europe enjoys a beer before the game. They could close it down. And I think that's the only way to increase the crowd there. What do you think? Well, that, that's one thing. And I can tell you, when I worked in the WHA in the 70s in Winnipeg, the one thing that the Winnipeg Jets did to entice people to go to the games because of a new league, the one thing they did was they had this beer sales, but they cut it off. When the third period started, that was it. There was no more. And they tried to do that basically to avoid any problems with drinking. Did it increase the crowds there? Did yes, it did. Ironically, at that time, because it was a new rival league, the league was trying to draw, and they were really trying to learn to walk before they could run. And it was tough, but they did uh, really enhance the crowds. Are you in favor of that, Steve, or? Well, 
let, let's understand Steve, one thing. First Steve off, wants to be non-committal no, on that. No, I, I will be right up front. I am not in favor of drinking and driving. Everybody knows that. But I am in favor if it can do something to keep professional teams in our own backyard. I don't want to see teams in our backyard move and leave our area. This is a gorgeous area to live in, and we want to keep people there. Sure, reason. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bob. Yeah, yeah thanks uh, to that caller. And we should uh, just mention quickly before we go to our next caller that uh, the problem is not with the 86ers. Uh, it's with the city of Burnaby. Uh, that's where the changes will have to be made if they're going to get a license down at Swan Guard. The stadium is set up nice, though, so you could even have one, uh, one area where drinking would be allowed. And I think uh, that would still not create any problems with the family environment that they love down there uh, at Swan Guard. We're going to go to South Surrey now. Rick, you're in the locker room. How are you doing, guys? We're doing good. good. That's good. Why is it that uh, other GMs can sign free agents like Boom Boom Boom? Pat Quinn looks like he's sleeping there. You know what's what's going on here? <laughs> well, you know uh, this is a you know kind of in character for Pat Quinn uh, from what I've heard from uh, sources around the city uh, that he usually everybody's expecting this big signing and they're going to get involved and they're going to really improve the team and then. Uh, they don't really do anything right away. Uh, some years they haven't done anything at all. I think, though, that Pat Quinn right now is working on uh, signing Oland right now. And one thing that I've got in my mind, and uh, there's no uh, official backing for this right now, it's just kind of a, a, an instinct, is that we know that Philadelphia will not go into the season with the same two goaltenders that they had last year. They're definitely looking for a goalie. They love Kirk McLean, and maybe there's something going on around there that, that they're looking at. Well, there might be, but uh, quite the note, speaking of goaltenders, and Corey Hurst the other day getting the offer in the mail from the Canucks. A little bit of a slap on the face. Maybe he's concerned about what might go on and how his future might be seen down the road. But uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm pleased with the Canucks style playing goal. They need McLean around. No questions asked. Maybe he's, I don't know, temperamental, moody. Call him whatever you want. But he is still a good, strong goaltender. Yeah, they have Mike Fountain, though. Yeah, they do. But uh, the question just is, let, just let me ask the caller, what uh, what do you think? Have you, uh, you, you have you heard anything? Uh, no, I haven't. But you know, I, I've read the province, and they let uh, Dave Gagne get away. Yeah, that, yeah, they did. He's gone. Yeah. What did you think about uh, Babbage resigning? I think it's good. Mm -hmm. They should have offered him a three-year deal plus an option. Yeah, they should have. So you, uh, what do you think about playing down in San Jose? Do you think that group of guys would have been a lot of fun for Dave to play with? No, he likes it in Vancouver. <laughs> he does, he does, and he, his family likes it too. Yeah. So he, he likes Vancouver. That's great to see Dave around. We want to thank you for your call. No problem. Okay. We're all keeping our eyes open. Uh, I think a, a lot of it has to do with, uh, in the lower mainland the, this season anyways, uh, people are expecting something to be done with the Canucks because of the way they finished off the year last year, and the Grizzlies have some opportunity to take their team to the next level. So I think people were expecting maybe uh, maybe you were at home. I know we were here expecting that uh, the teams might get active, very active right away. Wow. And uh, But sometimes caution is not too bad. Take a look yeah, around good. and uh, see what's up. Yeah, we'll see. Next caller, Collins. Hello? How are you doing? Uh, good. Um, I have two quick questions for you. Go ahead. Okay, um, my first is, do you think the Canucks made the, the right choice for their drafts? Okay, your second question? Um, I think there's too many teams in Vancouver. I think we should get rid of some because... Uh, which teams are you talking? Professional teams? Well, well they, yeah, like we've got, wait, let's see, we've got baseball and football and hockey and baseball. You, you don't think they can compete with each other in the market right now? Yeah. What, what, uh, what team do you follow, Caller? Uh, I follow the Canucks. You follow the Canucks, and do you think that you could possibly follow another sport as well? Yeah, probably, yeah. Which one would that be? Uh, probably the BC Lions. So you think the Lions and the Canucks are, en are enough? You don't like basketball? Uh, not really. Oh, really? Well, I, I, I mean, I do like basketball, but like Vancouver is not really a good team. Like, I mean, the players are good and stuff, but... Vancouver is going to be a better team. Don't you worry about it. And I think a little bit later when you start making a little bit more money when you're older, you'll be able to go to uh, all those games if you want to. Yeah. Thanks for your call. Okay. Well, you know, I don't, uh, I don't think we've got too many teams in, in Vancouver. It was like Dave Evans was saying. Years back, there was a situation where there was nothing to do virtually in the summer. Well, you know, uh, one thing that's going on in the summer, of course, the BC Lions. And uh, Darren Campbell, he's been busy last week. Uh, he's got a little bit of a report on the Lions. So let's take a look at this from Darren. The BC Lions won this past week 17-16 over the Calgary Stampeders in dramatic fashion. Damon Allen led the troops to victory as the drama went down to the final play. 
Stamps kicker Mark McLaughlin set up to kick the game-winning 40-yard field goal, but the kick went wide right. The fans stood and watched as returner Al Shipman attempted to get it out of the end zone, and the place erupted as he barely crossed the goal line with one outstretched football in hand. See the headline tomorrow, Al, uh, the frog leaped out of the end zone at the end uh, to give BC the victory. Tell me about that last play. I don't know, it was, it was real scary for all of us. Uh, I don't know, I just, the Lord was with me. He was with me, I was praying the whole time. <laughs> I was praying the whole time, Lord, just let him miss, let him miss. And then he missed, and I had the ball, and I took off, and it was just, all I saw was red and white. <laughs> I just trusted the Lord, man, get me out of here. And the uh, Lord made a way. It's difficult to find a rhythm. It's difficult to, uh, to you know, to get first downs. And, you know, when you're second and 20 or first and 15 before you start off, and, it, you know, that's, that puts us in a hole, and especially in this offense because uh, of the things we try to do, the short passing game. But, you know, we hung, we hung in there. You know, it's, there's days we played better and lost, and then there's days you don't play so good, but you find a way to win, and you find a way to, to keep your team in there. The Lions are in victory with those late heroics, but it was the defense that really gave them a chance. After a shaky start on the opening drive, they adjusted well and shut Garcia and the rest of the offense down. The injury-riddled secondary dominated. The linemen and linebackers put tons of pressure up front and really gave BC an opportunity to win. Two big defensive forces had some comments after the game. Second half we came out, we decided as a team that we we're going to try and stick together and try and stop them the best possible on defense and just hold them and, and you know, and just wait for offense to, to, to start clicking. And, uh, and it happened. I mean, there's a lot of new guys on defense running a new scheme. I mean, you know, we, we on the bend, we, but we're not going to break it. I mean, we just have to keep pushing it. And things going to happen for us this year. I really can feel I really feel it. I'm serious about that. Well, just a great opportunity to hear some of the comments from the players themselves. And just a note, uh, maybe you heard it or read it in the paper, uh, Coach Rita says that the <laughs> reason he was in so much trouble was because a few of the offensive linemen were turning around to see if that kick made it through or not. So uh, there's a lesson in there. Uh, just carry on with your blocking assignments and things will be well. Speaking of football, though, our next caller is Farhan. And if I'm not mistaken, this is a guy who's got <laughs> some football to talk about. You bet, Kevin. Great hey, show. How are you? Pretty good. Thanks for calling in. So I guess the 7-on-7 uh, seven seven is coming up. That's right. The second annual Reebok 7-on-7 seven seven football challenge goes uh, this Saturday and Sunday up at Burnaby North. And, of course, you knew I was going to call to get a plug in here. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, no. Actually, we were out at that tournament last year, and it was just great. Uh, we know that a lot of the high school players that were involved thought that it really uh, got them prepared for the fall season. Yeah, I think it, uh, it turned out to be very successful last year. Everybody involved was uh, ecstatic about it, especially the local schools. We're going to have 20 schools uh, participating over the weekend. Again, 10 from B.C., 10 from Washington State. And to give you an idea of how good the talent is, last year, 10 players from that tournament got Division One scholarships uh, south of the border to major U.S. universities, and about another 10 or 11 got scholarships to Canadian schools as well. So some of the best football you're going to see is going to be played this weekend. And what makes it so exciting is that the big, heavy, ugly linemen aren't invited <laughs> it's uh, just the fast guys are going to run around. It's going to be a real wide open, exciting competition, and it's a lot of fun for the fans and players. Oh, that's great, and uh, it's great to see that it's the second annual, so I guess you're going to be keeping this thing going for quite a while. Yeah, I think so, as long as we have uh, support from uh, from people like Reebok and yourselves over at Rogers, as well as you know the Burnaby Now and Human Performance Center and a bunch of those sponsors that, of course, uh, we're going to slide those plugs in there for. <laughs> I think it's, uh, it's going to be around for years to come. You know, it's funny, I was uh, in uh, Spokane last week for the Washington State All-Star Game, and um, I went into a, an establishment and, and ran into a bunch of coaches, and they'd heard about it. They'd said, oh, you're from uh, that school that runs the great passing tournament up in, uh, in Burnaby. And I, so, you know, and I was really surprised that, that they knew about it, so I think it's only going to get bigger and better as uh, the years uh, go. So first of all, Farhan, uh, if you're still there, tell us uh, what time the activities kick off on Saturday. Well, we play the round-robin portion on Saturday. First game goes at 11.30. We wrap it up at about 4.30. Uh, and then there's a uh, coaches and celebrity golf tournament that night, which, uh, Kevin, I'm, I'm thinking we're going to have to invite you to. I don't know what your handicap is. I know mine's my swing. 
And uh, then on Sunday, we have the championship round. That begins at 9.30. We wrap it up at 2. There are going to be some, uh, some football celebrities there. Jerome Payton, who's a North Vancouver guy, plays at the University of Washington. Uh, a number of other guys, Rob Meyer from Washington State, Darren Rao from Montana, all local guys that have gone on to excel, uh, as well as some NFL and CFL players. They're going to be there for the finals. The championship game goes Sunday at 1.15, and the award ceremony goes at 2 o'clock. So uh, it's going to be a great time, and we know we're going to have great weather. Thanks for, uh, thanks for calling in, Farhan, and we'll uh, talk more to you, I'm sure. Uh, people don't know uh, Farhan Lalji with uh, CBC and maybe off to TSN in the near future. Don't We've... be spreading those rumors now. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks for the call. We'll talk thanks, to you Farhan. again soon. Take care, We've got a, a pair of VIP passes, VIP passes to a beautiful catered Labatt's blue tent uh, down at Kitsilano this weekend for uh, the, the Pro Beach Series Tournament. Uh, we're going to give those away, so give us a call. Okay, we're going to go to Rick. Hi. How you doing? It's Big Rick from uh, South Surrey. Yes, sir. Give us a call. What's up, Rick? Yeah, I just, I, I was, uh, I caught the highlights of the Lions, but actually what I'm calling about was uh, I was quite happy to finally see the catcher of the Canadians, the Vancouver Canadians, move up to yeah. uh, Anaheim. Yeah, that was nice. It was a nice move. Finally. Yeah, he finally got what he deserved. Well, that, it's about time because everybody in the Lower Mainland has said it's been overdone. And we needed him there. And uh, what better thing to have happen to him? Yeah, well, he deserves it. Hey, Big Rick, before you go, um, don't you think it was nice that they uh, let him break the record for home runs first and then they brought him up to face Randy Johnson <laughs> for his first at bat? Yes. <laughs> okay, well, that's just the way it is. I guess everything gets easier for him from here on out. No hey, so you want to go down to Kitts Beach on the weekend and uh, sit in a beautiful catered tent and watch some great beach volleyball? I could handle it. Okay, well, you stay <laughs> on the line, and they'll, they'll set you up with some tickets. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Rick. Yeah, yeah, big uh, big event coming up that beach volleyball. I was watching some of it yesterday with Smith, uh, the American contingent. Boy, oh boy, are they ever strong. Okay, it's been great, as always, being here with you. Remember, we've got a huge week of sports ahead. Uh, we've got uh, lots of lacrosse going on. Real quick, on. before we forget, we are doing a remote show this coming Thursday. We are at Boomers at the Great Pacific Forum. Come on over. We are starting taping at 6 o'clock. Come on over and talk to us, and, and we'll uh, sit and talk about whatever you want to talk about. Manny Sobrell is going to be there. 86ers this Garth week. Well. Uh, you got lots to choose from. Enjoy some lacrosse. Enjoy the weather. Have a good week. Thanks for watching. If you don't play sport, at least be one. See ya. Meals for the production crew of Locker Room provided by Guppy's Pizza. Satisfy your taste as well as your hunger at Guppy's Pizza, located at 102-15625-96th Ave in Surrey. Phone 582-0222. Hairstyling for the hosts of Locker Room, provided by Gizmondi's, located at the north entrance of the Surrey Place Mall.